My name is Tish Pomadesi. I'm a marketing specialist with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And part of my role is being part of the Recruit, Retain, Reactivate team. R3 is what we call ourselves. And we work to bring more Californians to hunting, fishing, foraging, shooting sports, and just getting outdoors and appreciating our natural resources here in California. These Harvest Huddle Hours, H3, are a virtual program that we use to connect with people all over the state and offer resources to build confidence and get you you, our huddlers, more comfortable with the activity that you're most interested in. So today's huddle is on family fishing, introducing kids to fishing, how to teach kids to fish. As I mentioned, we have two very knowledgeable panelists. And before I introduce them, I want to remind everyone that all of our Recruit, Retain, Reactivate, Harvest Huddle Hours, our three H3s, are recorded, including this one. So if you hear something you like and you want to share it with someone, this episode will be available on our department's R3 page. Again, that's the web page that I already dropped in the chat. And it'll take a few days for us to get it up there, but it will be there. We have all the past uh, webinars there as well. There's 21 there for you to enjoy. Uh, that web, web page is wildlife.ca.gov forward slash R3. And what you do is you scroll down to the California Wild Kitchen tab, and then there you'll see a link for all the Harvest Huddle Hours. Before we get started, some real quick housekeeping. If you're new to the Zoom webinar platform, you can change the way your screen looks by clicking on the top right icons. There, there are two views, gallery and presenter. Feel free to play around with that and whatever you select isn't gonna affect anyone else's screen. So however you want your screen to look for the next hour, you just go ahead and do that. At the end of the session, we are going to have an opportunity for audience participation. We're actually counting on it. And how we're gonna do that is with the Q&A feature. And that is um, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the icons look like two little text bubbles. You just click on those to open the dialog box, submit your question and hit enter. I will be answering some as we go along, but if I don't get to yours right away, it might be because I'm gonna save it to ask in front of the audience live because maybe all of us can benefit from the information that the question you're asking. So um, just know that as well. I might save some questions till the end, but we might answer some as we go along as well. Like I mentioned, if for some reason your question doesn't get answered, uh, you could always, you know, if it's outside the scope of kind of what today's topic is. You can always email us. That email address is also in the chat. It's r 3 statewide program at wildlife.ca.gov. Now for our presenters, Aaron Ferguson is a senior environmental scientist specialist with the Central Valley Angler Survey for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife Fisheries Branch. She's native to Sacramento and received her Bachelor of Science and Master's from Sacramento State University, where she studied conservation biology, Fishy, fisheries emphasis, not fishies, but that could work too, probably. <laughs> She's worked for the department since 2005, hired as a fisheries biologist, environmental scientist. She's held her current title for 11 years and outside of work, she enjoys fishing, hunting, softball, and spending time with her family. She has partnered up today with Kevin Brannon, CEO of Real Angler Network and founding president of Real Guppy Outdoors, which is a family-friendly nonprofit that works to instill an appreciation for natural resources and spawning the next generation of sport fishing and outdoor enthusiasts. He has 25 years of experience working in Southern California waters as a crewman and applies his expertise, passion for teaching, documentary filmmaking, and storytelling to equip youth and families with education and skills to responsibly enjoy California's water and beaches. We are so happy to have him as an advocate and partner. Aaron, Kevin, thank you so much for being here today. I am going to turn my camera off and let you guys take it from here. Thank you, Tish. Um... Hi, my name is Erin. Like you said, I work on the Central Valley Angler Survey out of um, our West Sacramento office. I have to say that I have the best job in the world. I get to interact with the angling public in our anadromous waters on a weekly basis. And so, you know, being in this job has just been a really great opportunity for me to take, you know, my love of the outdoors and passion for fishing and you know, share that with anglers and, you know, share the joy of, you know, their fishing experiences. Um, my husband and I both work for the department in fisheries. It's something that is important to both of us. We, you know, we're raised fishing with our families. And so for our children, they're now um, four and seven. We 
started them fishing really young and um, it's important for us to instill our passion um, of fisheries to, um, to them. So I'm happy to be here today to talk about, you know, tips and tricks that we've used to get our kids um, involved in fishing. Hello, my name is uh, Kevin Brannan. <clears throat> I'm the host of the uh, Real Angler Network, which is Real Anglers Fishing Show. If you have a YouTube, you guys can check it out for the first time fishermen. Um, founding president of the Real Guppy Outdoor Program. Let's see, I'm just reading my little thing here on the bottom just to make sure I cover it all. But uh, I started working on fishing boats when I was about 11 years old and I just kind of have a knack for teaching. So I was able to teach like tourists that came into the Channel Islands area about what we had in our backyard, the Channel Islands Marine Sanctuary. And, um, and then when I started my filmmaking career uh, through Oxnard College, I wanted to make a TV show that was based on that. It was more showing, <clears throat> excuse me, and educating as opposed to highlighting maybe um, for, you know, far destinations or fish like on boats that people don't have. So I wanted to break it down under the terms and a logic that we taught a lot of the tourists that came out here to fish locally. In my area, there's a lot of um, single parents and low income families. And I knew we needed something positive and productive. So I took the resource that I had, which was my fishing poles and my knowledge of fishing. And we started doing kid fishing days here locally on the pier. Uh, we've taken about over 3,500 kids out fishing. We just finished up a workbook and we uh, started getting into the school system, but we like to teach, uh, it's called catch a memory. So it's not always about catching that monster or trophy fish. It's about catching that memory. And I understand, you know, teaching um, and the, um, composition of learning about what we're doing out there is more likely for you to have success. So we're able to teach that to the kids and their family. So it's a big family engagement program as well. If we could teach the parents how to fish, they're more likely to go out and get their own gear and start doing this more as a family tradition on a, a regular basis. But if it's foreign to them or it's a little intimidating, they don't know where to get started, they might pick another activity like a ball game or amusement park, something that's easier. So I keep all that in mind when I'm teaching these kids and these uh, families how to fish, but also how to enjoy the wildlife out there, how to be good stewards, how to be uh, learning about sustainable fishery, responsible angling, why there's limits and why we catch so many and stuff. So it's, you know, it's a real big educational um, background on what I like to do with my TV show as well as the kid fishing program. All right, absolutely. Thank you. All right, and so Kevin touched on this a little bit, but why why do people love fishing so much? You know, and I think that for a lot of us, it stems back to our childhood. You know, for me, I remember fishing with my dad and my sisters as a kid um, in the same boat, actually, that, you know, was in my um, introductory slide. I have that same boat that I learned to fish from, you know, as a kid, and now my kids are fishing from it. So for me, you know, it's full circle. And then now that I have grown up to become a fisheries biologist, you know, there for me, there's an added layer of, you know, the love of the environment and fisheries themselves that um, I think that fishing can instill in, in our youth. And so, you know, fishing creates a lot of memories. It builds on traditions that have been passed down to us. Um, like I said, Previously, I get to interact with thousands of anglers every year, and it's just really exciting for me even to, to be able to partake in their fishing memories. And so, you know, a good example that I always tell people is that one time I was out, you know, doing our survey. We were down in um, Sassoon Bay, which is near San Francisco, if you're not um, familiar. Um, and we came across a boat that had a man and his son and his son was probably about 10. He wasn't even old enough to have a fishing license yet because he did, doesn't need one. Um, they were fishing for sturgeon. It was the boy's very first trip and they caught one and we measured it. It was barely legal. You know, so they just got it in there and it had a $100 reward tag on it. So it was like the best day of this kid's life. You know, he's gonna be an angler forever. He's gonna tell everyone the story. I tell everyone this story. So it's just, you know, those types of experiences that just get ingrained in you and just, it's so exciting. Um, and so, you know, building memories, it's also a really great opportunity to get your kids outside and, um, you know, enjoying nature away from electronics. I don't know about you guys, but um, I just went through about a year and a half with my son doing distance learning. And so he was behind a screen. And so, just to have that opportunity to have 
you know, the, the original um, classroom, right, nature, and having them learn about the environment is really important um, for us. And it's just a great time to have a physical conversation, talking to each other, um, you know, about your day and about, um, you know, what we're seeing out there while we're there. It's just, you know, there's something magical about it. What do you think, Kevin? <clears throat> Yeah, I agree with that. You know, like we call it fellowshipping, right? Like when you're out fishing, um, when you're spending that time bonding. I know that when, you know, I, I coached my son um, at Little League Baseball and when I would see some of the kids that were out there, their parents kind of signed them up, but they weren't really interested in, uh, in sports. And that was kind of the same way. I'd rather be out on the pier or bodyboarding or something to do with the water, but I was I on my own terms, you know. Um, but I knew that keeping their engagement was, you know, let's, let's let them explore. I was able to see them, you know, they're playing with clovers or whatever. So I, I was using that as R&D at the time that I didn't realize that I was that I was doing. But the, another point to that is that when I'm watching my son play or my daughters play sports or something, I'm not unless we go play catch like on a Saturday for an hour. We're really not spending that time together. It's more like spectating, you know, where it's not something that we do together as a family. So you might go to a ball game or amusement park or something different just to kind of find some family entertainment when fishing is so much fun. Again, like she said, we all have that nostalgia point of where we caught our first fish when I tell people that I do a TV show or I do a kid fishing program, it's like they get tunnel vision to remember where they caught their first fish in that memory. And a lot of those grandfathers that used to, you know, spend that Saturday taking a kid fishing or something, they've kind of passed on. So it's up to us to pass that tradition. I get stories from um, other parents that come to the beach to say, you know, we used to do this as a family with my family, but we find other things to do. So we're really happy that you have this program because we could start getting, you know, getting back into it again. Um, it's definitely a, an, uh, a great uh, equalizer. Anybody could fish. We fish with kids that have special needs, um, at-risk youth. It's, you know, you don't have to have really a lot of uh, athletic ability, meaning that, you know, you're, but it's about problem solving as well. So when you let kids adventure, I find, because we don't like to say the word no, right? Fishing is problem solving. That's how life is. It's almost like the teach a man to fish, he'll fish forever, right? So as they're learning problem solving, they're learning, like she says, to measure the fish. And there's other things to do besides catch a whopper that we like to instill. And when you're that small, we all remember being that young, right? And we're able to play in the creek and you know, mm -hmm. find that fun and that, that adventure. But some of the reasons that people don't do it, I find just because it's kind of intimidating or foreign to them. They don't understand where to get started or what do they need or to walk into a store and ask for, for the right directions or outfit to get going. But if we you know if we start with the kids like, hey, let's have a kid fishing day. And it's not one designed to where uh, we're just going to let them catch a trout and keep them moving, but we're going to educate them. They're just like little sponges. They soak yeah. it up. They want to get the bait. And then if the parents are learning how to tie hooks, again, now you got something that they can do together as an equalizer. You don't have to be the greatest at it, at it but as long as you're out there having fun. And, and then, like she says, you start building that that bonding time. We could all, you know, nature has a way of helping us like open up and, and bond and, and fishing is one of those. So we start with the kids, but also introduce the parents and it becomes a fun tradition um, but again, the later that we wait to get started, it, there's statistics show that you might not fish. So if we could start young, you're more likely to keep that tradition and data will back that up. Yeah, absolutely. Hey guys, be, before we move on, Aaron, we had someone in the chat ask, uh, when you were telling the story about the sturgeon, did you say that it had a hundred dollar tag on it? I did. <laughs> yeah. And so the department has, um, a tagging program for striped bass and sturgeon where they put like a little tiny um, Peterson disc tag on it that has, you know, an, a unique number for that particular fish. And so it's a mark recapture program um, so that we can estimate the population abundance for those species. And so we are trying to incentivize returning those disc tags to the department because that's the only way that we can get that information back, right? Is if anglers turn those tags back in. And so a small portion will have rewards on them and not many are in that $100, um, you know, denomination. I think that they're usually pretty small, but that's what I'm saying. Like this was like a once in a lifetime day. Like it was just amazing. I That's the only $100 reward tag I've ever seen. That's so cool. So it was just amazing. Thank you for answering that. Sure. All right, and so just playing off of what Kevin was just talking about, there are so many learning opportunities out there that fishing can you know, teach us and our children. Um, 
So it's a really good opportunity to teach kids that food does not come from the grocery store. You know, like there are no magic meat fairies. Like I don't know. <laughs> um, and so these pictures right here, this is my son. Um, in both of these pictures, actually, he's been fishing since he was probably like, I don't know, two years old um, with us. And usually we just practice catch and release fishing um, because we only, for us, we only want to take what we're actually going to eat. And a lot of species that we fish for when we're with our kids are not species that we necessarily want to eat. Um, but my son, you know, through all of his different like fishing experiences has learned that, you know, that connection between fish and the table and so like he was really keen on providing dinner for his family and contributing in that way and so um he went crappie fishing with my husband and kept his limit um and we made fish tacos that night and it was just something that was really exciting for him like the, he'll say those were the best tacos he's ever eaten you know because he was able to contribute and you know like it just comes like full circle for him in his brain. It's really neat to watch that, him make that connection. Um, and then also it, it's a way to teach your children about the ecosystem and environment. And it doesn't have to be, you know, something really technical. I'm a fisheries biologist. So like I might teach my children a little bit more like details than like the average person, but you know, you can go out there and talk to your kids about you know, like the type of water body that you're at, are you in the river? Are you in the ocean? Are you in a pond? Are you in a lake? And then talk about, well, what kind of fish do you think live here? Why do you think that they live here and not in this other place? And then what kind, what kind of things do you think that they eat? Let's flip over some rocks and see what kind of insects are here. Maybe they like to eat these. And it's a good way, like Kevin was saying, like to you know, trial and error, like different types of lures to, you know, teach them and have them make that connection between, um, you know, the, the type of uh, prey that might be available in that environment and what the fish might eat. And like, if that doesn't work, let them experiment, let them try, you know, shrimp flies that are, look pretty for, you know, some species that it's clearly not going to work on, but who cares? Let them play, let them try. You know, and while you're out there, you you get to talk about, you know, the kinds of birds that you see and um, the butterflies and everything um, catching lizards. You know, like I like to bring like dip nets and butterfly nets for my kids to play with, you know, just so that we can see what what is out there and so they can explore. What do you think, Kevin? Yeah, that's that's a big part of it. You know, I, I get. Um, we, we do a couple of surveys here and there, or just the parents would tell us about a, a trip that we've taken the kids on. And one of them is the hunter gather, hunter gather feeling that you just talked about, like when they really yeah. get to come home and go through the whole process of catching a fish, a you know, keeping a legal fish and then um, processing it. And then you guys get to harvest it for dinner or lunch or wherever. Like I see somebody has a question yeah. about camping, but yeah, there's just something that we have like inside of us. Right. And when we get to do that, almost like growing your own vegetables or something, you know, or a kid yeah. that might raise, again, just as an example, maybe raise their own cattle or something. But when you know that you had your hands in on um, producing that, you know that there's just a gratification that you don't get. Uh, other things that we learn teaching it again about the responsible angling, you mentioned the fact that there is limits to the fish. And I've seen kids that come out on like a boat trip that they're fishing half the day, but then when it becomes time, like we're measuring fish, they know that a calico bass has to be 14 inches and you keep five. And they kind of turn away from the fishing and start kind of turning into a little environmentalist, right? They're, that's a calico bass. Now they're identifying the species and then they're running over to the, uh, to, to, to measure it with the other kids. So even just being on the outdoor part of it, there's more to it than again, like I say, always catching that trophy because you'll find that the kids like, again, experimenting. It's like a, a giant, like classroom, you know, that they get to touch. They're learning these things without being taught. Somebody mentioned that to me recently. One of my books I was reading was I like to learn, but I don't like to be taught, you know, as funny as that sound, but as you're letting them experiment and try it and they get to get away from fear, kids are cutting bait. There's just so many different things that, again, by what the slide says about teaching them um, to fish besides again, just catching the trophy. So we try to instill in them too. Like we're not going to just go out and catch a bunch and catch a limit. Sometimes they bite, sometimes they bite, sometimes they don't. Like she says, yeah. uh, 
patient patience, but also again the attention span. So if you could find things to keep their attention, at the old days of just sitting there holding a rod and you know wait for a minute while dad drinks a beer and just wait for them to bite, we're gonna lose them. So if you let them try different lures in there, again, if you see that, hey, there's grubs under this rock, let's try one of these little plastic grubs that are in our box. We didn't even know what it was for. Again, give it them a try. And I always say about fishing, it's not really lying when you're telling fishing stories. So if they catch, if they hook a tree or something else, play along with it, you know, let them continue yeah. to go into the tackle box and try new things out. So again, again, it's not just, again, I said it twice, it's not just catching that fish, but let the trial and error and using it and then that nature part. So there's a lot more to it. And, uh, then bring it home, you know, some, something to eat some days you will, some days you won't. But again, that's all part of the process of teaching about being outside and enjoying the whole environment. Yeah, absolutely. And going back to learning without realizing you're learning, you're absolutely right. Like when, you know, there is like a size limit, um, on fish, it's a good way to teach kids, you know, how to use a measuring tape or, you know, like a ruler, um, and have it be like something tangible instead of, or a way that they know that they would use it as opposed to like in school where they're just learning and they don't necessarily apply that to the real world. But if they could, you know, um, use that um, measuring tape and like figure out, you know, like lengths, then like it makes more of a connection without them even realizing it, you know? And, and again, I think when you take some of the uh, restraints off of kids and let them try, you'll see how far they can really go, you know? Yeah. If they remember, when you give them some responsibility and have some realistic expectation, they're, they're more likely to continue to want to fish. If you just bore them, and I, again, I learned this doing uh, some other volunteer work when my son was younger. I've taken all my kids fishing, but as, you know, coaching or being in the scouts, what the kids seem to continue to allow them to do and not shut them down because they're eight or nine, but giving them enough responsibility that they're going to take it and, and run with it and be responsible. We know how to watch over them. You know, they'll gain that, that confidence, you know, that, that will carry on in other parts of, of their day activity just by being outdoors and getting rid of some of the fear and being responsible. Absolutely. All right. So before you go fishing, there is some homework that, you know, you should do before your trip. So you should have an idea in mind of either where you want to go, you know, like if you want to go to somewhere near you or you're going camping and you want to see, you know, like what water bodies are near that particular location, or if you're looking for like a particular fish species um, to fish for. And so, you know, there are lots of good resources out there. The department has um, a fishing guide that is available on our website where you can zoom in across the state on various um, water bodies. And you can see that in the le upper left-hand corner. And then you can search by body of water and then click on it. And then you can see what fish species are available to catch in those particular areas. And if it's like a pond or a lake that is stocked, there will be a, a planting schedule um, available for you. So that's a good resource so that you can find, you know, particular areas, especially if you're not, or if you're new to fishing and you don't even know where to start. Um, I would start somewhere like that. And then for, um, as far as equipment goes, um, I, when it came to our kids, we started them really young around, you know, two to three years old. We bypassed you know, like those miniature fishing rods, um, those aren't bad or anything. We just decided to go straight for, um, you know, about like a five foot light action fishing rod with that had like a button reel. So it has a closed um, reel on it with just one button that um, is really easy for them to learn to cast with. And so practicing some basic skills at home prior to going out, I think, is, is a really good place to start. We, with our kids, we would put um, just a little piece of pencil lead, it's just basically a weight, on the end of the rod and had them practice casting in the backyard. And also, you know, getting to know like what the buttons on the reel does and how to reel in the first place. Um, Cause that does take like a little bit of um, getting used to, cause it's not generally with your dominant hand and then casting you know, just getting like the basic feeling of how it works. And I think that that will eliminate some frustrations that you may have when you get down to the water, if you could just practice basic skills at home. And then also um, learning how to tie basic knots um, 
is good and figuring out how to like attach lures and bait and everything at home. You can, there's a lot of videos that are available um, to watch at home before you go out there and then, you know, get frustrated. Um, and then um, just making sure that your kids know that it's called fishing, not catching, right? So, you know, it might not be, you might not catch anything on your first day, or you might catch a barely legal sturgeon with a hundred dollar reward tag. You never know, you know, fishing is fishing. Um, what do you think, Kevin? What do people need to know before going out? Yeah, there is a little etiquette to fishing, you know, you want to make sure that if you do go out, you know, there's like space areas and maybe, um, you know, you might need sunscreen, water, we tell them, you know, whatever you pack in, pack it out, you know, again, the, that yeah. part of it to make it be bring an extra bag, pick up a little extra litter around your area. Just again, those are things you can do while you're out there to be good stewards. Uh, the right equipment is good. We get a lot of folks that show up with stuff that they bought from a department store that they don't know how to use. It's still good. It's just a matter of where is it going to work out appropriately. So again, yeah. I'm going to plug that fishing show, Rolanger's Fishing Show one more time. So this is, I'm out of Southern California and we do a lot of um, Southern California fishing at Real Anglers, but we teach you again how to cook the fish, different species that we fish for, uh, and the, in the different setups. Hold on. <laughs> Got a truck right here. Uh, the different um, fish that you fish for, the species. But the good thing about having a device is you could actually kind of YouTube a video on if I want to surf fish, do I want to fish on the pier? Do I want to fish at the lake? They might be able to give you some quick little five or 10 minute little tutorials. We had a kid one time, we were taking out. Uh, some uh, a group called uh, Moretto. They were a little um, a marine institute in the summer. So I was teaching a couple of kids how to knot tie, and one kid just went, sat down, opened up YouTube, and tied his own hook. He didn't want to wait for the volunteer to get to him. So there's ways where you can use your device yeah. uh, just to get some great tips. You know, I call it the Martha Stewart. You know, if I watch Martha Stewart make some brownies and I follow her recipe um, on YouTube, I could definitely make sure my brownies come out a little bit better than if I did maybe just read read the box or something. So there are ways to use that. There's also some different, um, if you're looking to fish in a certain, uh, we call them communities like surf fishing or kayak fishing or something. There's some great groups that are on Facebook that you can look into and ask questions. A lot of fishermen will share their, their tips with you. Whether, and if you go to a pier, guys next to you might help you out. So, but again, it's just, you know, common courtesy, that sort of thing, making sure you're not crowding somebody's spot. But um, like she said, when I learned how to cast, I just stood in my front yard and I tied a sinker by itself and I just kept casting it out. I got a bunch of rat's nests or bird's nests or whatever you want to call it, backlashes, and I learned how to take them out. But again, everything is in repetition. A lot of what you're going to probably hear me say, again, is about the learning experience of fishing because it's a lot of the problem solving. I'll probably say that through half the slides, but that's the way I learned. That's the way I like to teach, and I think that's the best way for us to learn. So don't be, you know, but just encourage that. Hey, let's get out there and just cast. Um, make sure you're doing your overhead casting. Again, the push button reel is what most people start with. It's so easy and convenient, you know, so... Mm -hmm. Uh, there's different ones on the market. Another way I, I would recommend, maybe if you go to a local tackle shop near you, maybe different than a department store, perhaps the lady in, or the man that's working in retail might not know what you're looking for directly. So you might go home with just a combo that might not work for exactly what you're fishing for. So maybe look for a local tackle shop or something at the lake that has it where you could talk to them, somebody that fishes that area a lot that can get you the right outfit for what you're fishing for and the right tips, you know? So combination of, you know, might be watching some videos first, calling ahead. I work at a sport fishing landing. We answer all the questions that you have for first timers. Again, they know that this sport is a little intimidating and there's a lot of questions. So just ask them, you know, don't be afraid to ask the, the right questions to make sure you bite because then they're gonna have a much uh, a, a much better chance of, of catching fish, you know? So th those sort of things, looking for structure, you see a dock or you see where there's rocks or some, some uh, bushes where they're, they're going to have uh, fish are going to be hiding out or crawdads and stuff like that, then again, you know that that's where you want to place your lure. So again, just a little study. Again, the kids are learning these things in the family together, not even knowing that they're really, yeah. you know, they're being taught. So that, that's what I like to say. And again, just managing expectation. You might not go out and catch a bunch, but I'm telling you, if they have fun and you make it fun and, and you find other things to do, they'll be, they'll be bugging you to take them back out again. Yeah. And to address this last point about packing essentials, just make sure that your kids are going to be and yourself are going to be as comfortable as possible out there. And so, you know, make sure that you're checking weather conditions for where you're going, bring layers of clothing, chairs, if that's not available at that location, um, sunscreen hat, um, sunglasses, and lots of snacks. There's something about fishing and being outside that makes you like really hungry. So just make sure you bring all the snacks. Can't go without. We, we take beef, turkey, sunflowers, <laughs> pork rinds. It's mandatory. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> beef jerky. Um, and so along those same lines, like how do you keep your kids interested while you're out there, especially if maybe you're not catching? Um, so I suggest to people, especially when you're learning to let your children or your family like dictate um, the trip length, like don't for a very first trip, don't plan something that's really far away that, um, you know, a really hard species to fish for that, you know, has a, um, takes a lot of time um, or has like a low catch rate, you know? So um, we tend to, I live up here in the Central Valley. And so for me, or up for us available up here, the fisheries that are generally easier to fish for that are close to home would be, you know, black bass, catfish, uh, bluegill is a big one and planted trout. Like those are great species um, to start kids on. And they're um, available across the state, really. Um, uh, you could use that fishing guide to find, you know, like lakes and ponds near you that have those. And if you're not, if you're not catching anything, just use that time that you're out there to focus on your family. You know, like Kevin was saying, have have that time to like talk with everybody and explore um, the area around you and splash around in the water. It doesn't always have to be about, you know, trying to catch that fish the whole time you're there. Um, use it as a time to talk to them about ethical angling behavior. Like Kevin was saying, pick up some trash, you pack it in, you pack it out. We want to, besides like instilling a passion for the outdoors and fishing, we want to create good environmental stewards and it can start there when you're at the water. What do you think, Kevin? Yep. I say I just giving them that responsibility, you know, like if you yeah. give it to them and you'll see it like, and they're making an impression. I remember my son, we were going to uh, fish the jetty and these guys are drinking beers at the beach and the guy like throws his beer and breaks all the, the glass. And my son's like, dad, why is he doing that? So it's like the opposite effect could happen when they see kids that are out helping, you know, you kind of make sure ah, if they can do it, I can do it kind of thing, you know? Yeah. So we're able to use visual aids as these youngsters are allowed to set an example for adults. Like look at what they're doing, you know, and you never know what you could you know, make that impression on somebody, but when they see it, um, the trip length, we do ours from eight to 1130 when we do our monthly beer fishing day. And that's for the same reason. You do get some kids that want to come for an hour at first and try it out. And then you get kids that tie themselves to the pier and they're like, just one more cast. Yeah. I want to stay at her all day. Yeah. And the same uh, on a boat trip is that uh, we I recommend people that go on a boat on the ocean, maybe start at eight o'clock, you know, make sure you can handle a full day on the water. You think about you get up yeah. early, right? Everybody early bird curse is warm. We're all up early, but you could burn out from the sun, the um, just being outside just for a little while. You know, it's a little it's it's active. If you got to hike in a little bit to uh, to a to a um, area to fish like the uh, the bank of a lake or something, you know, kind of bring that in and, you know, to see how much you guys can handle. Because again, if, if it just starts and, and also keeping their interest is like we talked about a couple of times is learning like to explore, right? That's, that's the big part. Yeah. You cannot do the old fashioned way of just sitting there and, and waiting for a fish to bite. Because if you're fishing a lake or a pond, or you're getting started and that's the mentality and you don't catch a fish, they're not going to want to come with you next time to find yourself right. fishing by yourself. So those are just things that we do. Um, again, to keep their interest, man. And I learned these things like watching kids in Cub Scouts where they were giving them limitations on what they could do at eight versus 10. And I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. My son is already cutting bait at seven years old. He could handle a knife already, right? As long as they're that responsibility that you let them have and letting them try things is so, so important. Just like we all want to try new things, right? With it, within reason. So we like to, you know, my volunteers that help out myself. And these are also things that I've learned working on sport boats is people really want, we all, we're all a kid inside and we want to be able to try as much as we can with being safe. So I encourage that part of it, you know, let them get dirty, bring some shorts, yeah. let them splash in the water, get mud in their toes. You know, like there's things that you do. It's like, you're just using fishing to lure them in. I like to say that one to get them to do outdoor activities with, that we can do, but just, you know, Fishing is just one that's a little harder because it's intimidating on what to do with all that gear. But if you break down those barriers and allow them to have fun, that's the big tip. We're going to go have fun today. And as a, and if we catch some great food and we get to eat it, that's fantastic. If not, well, that gives us a reason to come back and try it again to get the one that got away. But if it's not fun for them and you're not letting them experience it and, and explore, it's just going to be harder for them to to uh, to keep wanting to, um, to experience it. So keep that in mind. Just, you know, go out and have some fun. Yeah. And. You reminded me of another thing that um, 
we've done like with our kids when they are, you know, when they get bored and because we're not catching anything, uh, we just let them play with our lures or the bait, you know, like let them play with the night crawlers, let them play with the sardines, um, let them play with lures that don't have hooks in them. You know, we have like a couple swim baits that, you know, rubbery swim baits with no hooks in them. And my son will still play with them like outside of fishing. Like he just has his own that, you know, these are his, his toys, you know, like it's just fun for them. Like Kevin was saying, let them explore and um, figure things out. And there are so, fishing doesn't have to be intimidating, like Kevin was saying. There's so many resources that are available to you to help you ease into this, you know, experience. And so I always tell people to like lean into your friends and family that have fishing experience. We all know somebody that fishes. So where do they like to go? What do they um, fish for? What do they use? Can I borrow your some of your equipment so that, you know, like I don't have to spend any money while I'm figuring out whether I or my child likes this sport? Kevin was talking about going to local bait and tackle shops. They're the ones that know, you know, where people are catching fish and what they're using and they'll help you. That's their job is to help you there. And in the age of social media, there are so many platforms that have fishing communities that you can reach out to. And I think Kevin had said, you know, like they're not going to necessarily tell you where their secret fishing spot is. But if you say, hey, I want to get my kid on some fish, they're lining up to help you because we all remember being a kid and you know, the feeling of catching your first fish, like you don't lose that memory. Like it's just something that is ingrained in you and everyone wants, you know, to um, have other children like feel that. Um, there are online videos and tutorials available to you and television shows. I'm gonna let Kevin talk about those cause that's like his bread and butter right there. Um, but also like I plugged this a few times but we do have that um, fishing guide available um, as a resource too. Yeah, so oh. I mind again, Roll Angler's a little worm. Where's he at right here? This guy, Roll Angler's Fishing Show, <laughs> R-E-E-L. But um, other ways are TV shows, and I put down guides and services, as well as clinics. I know this last week at yeah. Morro Bay, there's a surf fishing uh, clinic. The guru, his name is Bill Varney, and he puts together a clinic, you know, where they go do surf fishing. And I know they do this in freshwater and saltwater. Um, I use a guide and a service when I go fish the lakes because I'm more of a saltwater guy. It's funny because I kind of drive them crazy because – I think I'll, I'll try to bring in my own fishing experience, but again, I'm in a new water. I'm in a new area. So I have to remind myself that I need to listen to the guide to make sure I catch a bass. I got, I went out and got skunked because I was trying these different ways. Like as a fisherman, right? I could overthink, well, this worked over here in this environment. Yeah. Let me try it here. And then it's like, well, I forgot I got a guide here, but me and my son did a video with him and, um, and he would tell us things like, you know, worms don't swim that fast because I was retrieving it. Like I was, you know, saltwater fishing, but there are guides and services that will, that will take you out. And I always say the same thing, but it, Disneyland is like a hundred bucks. You know, you could get you and your, you know, on a, they have like what we call small intimate trips where it's just two or three of you guys. You don't need to be on a party boat, which is another option where that's where I started working at tying hooks and getting people out there fishing uh, was on the party boats, but you have deck hands and crew members. They're going to be there to help you or check out a clinic or check out, like you said, you on social media, on Facebook, if that's where, if it's in your area, right, you just limit it down. I live inland. I want to fish Sacramento. I'm sure there's something for the Delta. I live in California and I want to fish Calico Bass. There's a group for that. I want to kayak sand, cra uh, sand crab, um, surf fishing. That's why I said that. That's a big one. That's so easy. It's very similar yeah. to lake fishing. You walk up and down. You don't need much but a rod. Uh, you get to look at the sun rising. I mean, there's other parts of it, but there's groups for that. You can reach out there and say, hey, this is something I think is easy enough for us to start at. And they'll have clinics or they'll have a, hey, we all meet and have coffee on this morning, or we have a fishing club that meets that does a lot of saltwater or fly fishing. So those are the things that you could join with your friends and family um, that you can do it. And again, you'll get that information at a tackle shop. So fishing, again, that's one good thing about having a device is that it, it's easier. It's at the reach, you know, the in the palm of your hand that you could get some of these resources for, you know, hey, I, I want to go to YouTube. I want to fish bass. How do I do it? Boom, there's one for bass fishing. Hey, I want to do surf fishing or something like that. So there are resources out there more than ever that it's easier to get a hold of 
as opposed to the old days of just really walking into a sporting goods store and trying everything from scratch. That was a little bit harder, but now the resources are much easier. And again, if you do catch a fish, they're really going to want to go out. So you really want to, you know, get whatever resources you can, um, tips and stuff and, and the right times and areas to go to just make sure you still do catch a fish because that's going to help a lot. But those are some that will help you. Yeah, absolutely. And so speaking of fishing clinics, um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife has a program called Fishing in the City. Um, it was created as a way to improve angling opportunities to California's growing urban populations. And it, it's focused in areas where uh, populations have identified that lack of free time, you know, is the primary reason why they either had stopped fishing altogether or don't fish as much as they would like to. And so through this program, um, ponds in, in city centers, and there's many across the state, have been stocked with catfish and trout. And the department will put on in-person fishing clinics for various, you know, angling levels from introductory to advanced aquatic education. And so for children and adults, where they'll teach you, you know, the basics of casting and tying lines or tying your knots and putting on lures and, and catching fish. And so it's a really great opportunity for people to experience fishing without having to travel very far from home. And it, um, like I have these bullets on the bottom, it's available all across the state. Um, right now, we are not putting on in-person clinics. We're hoping, you know, as COVID subsides that um, we can return to in-person clinics soon. Um, but check that website um, for the schedule for when those clinics resume and check out all of the resources that are available um, through that website. And so they have um, video tutorials on different aspects of fishing. There's literature there and brochures. There are coloring books, you know, for the kids and lots of educational um, material there. So it's a really cool um, resource that the department has. And so another great uh, fishing program, Real Guppies Outdoors. Yep. So that's us right there. This is our mission right here, just provide a positive environment and program for youth using outdoor experiences, emphasizing education, life building lessons, leadership, stewardship, and team building. Um, yeah, we take about at least 400 kids out. That's because we do uh, we do a clinic on the fourth Sunday of every month, except for November and December because of the holidays take time off and let our board get a break, but it's a clinic style. So that again, we're teaching them how to tie it. We used to open it up and we'd have like 150 people show up, but it was really hard for us to teach. So we slowed it down and keep it to about 60 maximum. And it's definitely uh, helped so people could learn those uh, those fishing tips and, and to learn how to do it. So that way they, they want to do it on days when they're not with us. You know, they want to go on another day. They don't have to wait for the guppies to have a, um, a kid fishing day for them to come out. And again, encouraging the families to really get involved too, not just the kids. If we could teach dad and mom how to tie hooks. I mean, we've had three generations. We've had kids, dads and grandpas out there all together, grandmas, you know, when they're doing it together. And it's like, man, we've been wanting to do this. I've heard kids jump up and down like, this is the best day of my life. And they caught one little fish and it's an, yeah. just crazy because they're out there or how excited they get when their dad, I seen a little girl, my dad caught one, my dad caught one. It's just something that gets them going. And you can see here on the left on that picture, see how we keep it all hands on. That's a sand shark right there that we caught. And it has little spines on the back, but you can see one of our volunteers is holding it while the kids get to touch it. Again, you start to get away from that fear. You'll see what else the they're willing to do. So we make sure we keep it all hands on, let the kids do as much as they can. And that's part of the clinic style when it's not so much mayhem with a bunch of people. I, I did help out a, a couple of the fish, the city ones, and it was great. You see these kids that don't know each other within an hour fishing by each other. Now they got a good fishing buddy and you're building friendships that way, right? They're fishing together later. And we've done it where they stocked a pond in Simi Valley with catfish and bass. And we come out there and we get them hot dogs and it's funny because you'll see people show up again with that stuff that they don't know what to do, that they bought their kid maybe for Christmas or a birthday, and they've been waiting for an opportunity to use these things and catch something. So we're able to do that, showcase it to them, let them use it, and then demonstrate it and let them try it. And they're so happy. And then they got a buddy that they met right next to them, and they're just as happy to catch a fish. So by having these these days, we use this term called give us a half a day because by noon, I tell them, before Bob Barker spins the big wheel, your kid will be tying their own hooks. So that means by about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock they're already learning how to do this stuff. And that's a very important part. So you can look for the clinics, the department, official wildlife has a website uh, that you'll find a bunch of that stuff up and down California. But then, you know, down here in Southern California, we do ours on the fourth Sunday. So there are great, 
clinic style learning experiences that are always promoted more now than ever before if you just do a little research and they put some up there for you but they're out there absolutely very cool so I just wanted to touch on regulations really quick. Um, children do not need a fishing license until their 16th birthday, um, but adults obviously over 16 do. Um, the department holds two free fishing days a year. The first one is usually around the 4th of July holiday that weekend, either before or after, and then around Labor Day. And so both of those dates have already passed for 2021. Um, so be on the lookout for uh, the next ones for in 2022. Um, and then our regulations are no longer printed. They're available online only. Um, and so you can download those, those to your phone prior to going out. Um, you just want to make sure that you know what the regulations are for that particular water body that you go to before you go out there. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so you could check out our website. That's where we have our inland and um, ocean uh, fishing regulations located. So do you want to add anything to this slide, Kevin? Oh uh, yeah, just that you know, it is part of a uh, responsibility. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. That again, we call it the responsible angling. And if you're not um, responsible, that's what we're teaching the kids about regulations: is how fish, some fish might be overfished to extinction because you know previous uh, generations might have overfished it by night. Uh, using a regulation, yeah. you know, just, just keep fishing until it's gone. So it's really important that we have the term that you might hear kicked around as sustainable fishery. That means that you could catch a fish, your grandkids would catch a fish, that there'll be fish here for years to come. And then there's also programs what your license covers for stocking fish like trout or white sea bass in our area. So some of the, the money that comes in through licensing people don't un, uh, understand is that that goes for programs that you're seeing here right now. And, you know, yeah. so you're responsible conservancy, um, meaning that there's a, a sustainable fishery that we could continue to fish for, for the species in our backyard and it's maintained. And that's a big part of it is maintaining fishing for sport fishing and recreational uh, usage for years to come. So when I get as you teach that to uh, families and youngsters early on, they're going to pass that down tradition. So, you know, and, and, and not knowing is not going to get you out of the ticket. So if you right. know where you're, for, where you're at, um, the, if a, uh, um, a ranger comes up to you or a warfinger comes up to you and he just wants to look to see what you caught to make sure it's just to make sure everybody's doing the right thing and, you know, just, you know, work with them and they're out there to make sure everybody's doing it the right way. And we all want to make sure we're all doing it the right way. So that's, that's why yeah. we have the regulations to follow. Absolutely. All right. So this is our closing slide. I would just like to say that, you know, fishing, we talked about it earlier. There's so many things that fishing can do for you. You know, it's not only just catching fish, it's being outdoor in nature, it's bonding with your family, it's creating lifelong memories, creating, um, you know, better environmental stewards. You know, they're our future. And so we want them to want to take care of our environment. And so I would just encourage you to get out there and take your kids fishing. It's, it's a great opportunity for all of us. Kevin? Yep, yep. Just get out there and explore, man. And eventually you can see how this picture on the left, the kids are like standing in the crab net and hoop net, right? Like they're exploring to the finest or the kids in the creek. I mean, I was that little kid in the creek. I had a pair of creek shoes that we couldn't even wear in the house because they smelled so bad when you step in the mud. Um, but we got to play in the creek, man. Just let them go out there yeah. and explore, get scared under their nails. The reason the term we got guppy when we were filming the real anglers kids fishing days before we were a nonprofit, we would give the kids. So the ones on the right are my son, my nephew and my best friend's son. And we would give them a camera called the guppy cam so that we could film it from the kids perspective, right? Their angle, because we could see what the kids are doing when there wasn't an adult kind of around. But then we also learned that by having the other kids in there exploring and showing them that they didn't, uh, that it was okay. They were able to like, like little sponges and say, well, if that little seven year old is doing it, then I can do it. You know, by, by showing them it's okay to explore and giving them a trip. I mean, that picture on the right just says it all right there on the bottom, you know, just exploring. One kid's caught a fish, the other one's swimming, the other one's, you know, in her dress. And it's like fun, you know what I mean? That's what the fun part is. So make sure you keep it fun, explore, let them try things that are safe. But that's that's yeah. half of it. And because when you allow that to happen and explore, like we all want to do, remember we always have to build forts and play around and we don't want to outgrow that. So if you, if you yeah. continue to let them do that and give them responsibility, you're going to see they're going to want to do it more more often than not. Yep. 
All right, guys. Any, uh, any questions? Very cool, or? guys. We have a, a lot of questions, actually. And um, while you were talking, I looked up on the fishing in the city, Aaron, and we, we have an event on November Ooh. 12th. Cool. It's in the Sacramento area, but it looks like, like you said, we are slowly trying to get things going again, but I put a link to it in the chat for people. Um, I'm going to click on it again because I forget what date it was in November, but it looks like it's um, November 13th, Saturday at Granite Regional Park in the Sacramento area from eight to 12. Oh, yeah. Cool. So um, like Aaron mentioned, we, the department is starting to slowly bring things back you know, after the pandemic, but I'm going to get right into the questions that were coming in. So this first one, um, I've been waiting patiently to answer or ask live for her. Uh, we've been fishing about 10 times, haven't caught anything yet, which is fine. A few times we've been fishing at McNear's Pier, and I've only seen people catch these giant stingrays, and it was a little jarring. How do I not catch one of those? <laughs> You want to go or you want me to go? Oh, uh, that's all you. <laughs> all right. So uh, you won't get, so again, your way, the way you're fishing is targeted. I know when we fished on here, there, we catch more stingrays on squid or shrimp. So you okay. might want to try something different than those two baits, um, mussel. So what we teach is like the fish have their, I mean, they're, they're definitely going to eat whatever they come across for the most of the time. Right. But they do. You were saying shrimp. hot dogs that some people bring out hot dogs. That's usually when they're fishing for like catfish, right? Okay. But if, you, if you're fishing for like, um, let's say you're fishing in the surf, right? Sand crabs work really good to catch perch. You know, those are the things that you're going to use in the same way you're going to use uh, when you're fishing in the freshwater is what is their, the fish that are in that body of water and what primarily is their diet. So okay. um, shrimp and squid is probably going to catch you more uh, stingrays than not. So I would go with um, maybe mackerel or anchovy, more like a, we call it fin bait, you know? as opposed mm. to that, uh, maybe try some muscle, uh, artificial baits, like uh, fake worms or, or uh, again, like fin bait ones that look like anchovies. Uh, crocodiles might work in that area. So something more of a fin bait as opposed to usually, I think we catch a majority, I would say nine out of 10 of our stingrays are usually caught on squid. So see okay. what they're using. That way you kind of know what not to use either. If, they're, yeah. if that's the bait they're using, just use an alternative. Okay, so stay. Go ahead, Erin. Oh, I was gonna say, I don't ocean fish. So like, I don't know if this would be right, but I think like, so stingrays stay on the bottom, right? Of the, of the ocean. So could you not have as long of a, a line or, you know, keep it up, use bait that like stays off of the bottom so that you're not necessarily catching bottom dwelling fish species and targeting yeah, so something else? We call that column fishing, right? So you're right, exactly. That was gonna be my next point is that they their mouth is on their bottom. So they're on the bottom scurrying. Yeah. That's, that's what they're gonna eat. So we we'll, might put a, a, a flotation device, an indicator like a yeah. bobber. Oh. You fish more surface fish like a jack smelt and the macro, and that's gonna be on the top of that. So you might use a bobber to keep it up off the ground. We also right. do it sometimes where we elevate the, uh, we put a couple of hooks with a heavier sinker on the bottom and still tie a bobber just to float the bait off of the bottom, yeah. as opposed to laying primarily on the ground where crabs and stuff will eat it. You could put it to where, again, we call it the columns as opposed to flat on the surface. I'm sorry, flat on the bottom, uh, and then have the hooks elevated in the middle. So that's another great point yeah. is to keep it up off the bottom and fish more of the surface with the bobber. Just in the ocean, there's more current than a lake. Yeah. So your bobber could end up like halfway yeah. up the pier because the current will take it. So just be mindful of that. Such good tips on that one, guys. Um, okay, so what is it? What, what age is it okay for a kiddo to have a hook on their line? So far, I just stick to a bobber and a weight, but they really want a hook. You guys are saying as long as you know, like judge your own child, and as long as they know the responsibility and safety factors, no, no age is really too early, right? Yeah, I mean, I started my kids two or three years old. Um, you know, like. I don't want to say they were like pros and like going off on their own. They were supervised, you know, like right, we yeah. practiced at home. And then once we got out there, we helped them cast it out so that, you know, they're not hooking us or like the tree or, you know, um, yeah. As long as they're supervised. Yep. That's what we call it. <laughs> At our guppy program, we say we don't age out because uh, a lot of the times the, the parents are going to help the, the, the young ones, but we've had kids fishing out of the little like kangaroo pouch. 
kids fishing yeah. out of a small yeah. trailer. Uh, <laughs> he's a little like smaller, a smaller pole, but we just kind of limit what they're allowed to do. So maybe they don't let them hook the bait, um, but they can yeah. reel in the fish still. They can do all that kind of stuff. But again, if you show them and, and break it down to them, I started having my kids out on sport boats at four years old. All my kids, uh, about four years old is when I would take them out. But again, it's just, again, reminding you that just giving them as much as they could handle um, right. and just being careful. But if they know that you show them, hey, this is what you do and this is why, for the most part, uh, I've never had any real big problems with with the hooks, just letting them try it. But I mean, if you want an alternative to press it down till they get comfortable, you know, by all means, put, you know, smash down the barb. There's, you know, you can never, I guess, be too careful. But um, as mm -hmm. far as age goes, I've had fish kids fishing between two and four years old with no problem. Okay, you know? great. Uh, okay, so I hope to catch a fish while camping. If this happens, I will fry up the fillets. What do I do with the rest of the fish, bones, head, fins, et cetera? Chuck it back in the lake, in the ocean? How do you be good stewards and do the right thing after you've caught the fish and are preparing it? I, I, I let guess, nature take its course. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we just, you know, what we don't going to use. Sometimes we'll take like the, the, um, the heads of the fish that we keep catch to use in the crab nets. But, you know, as long as we're processing, you're not wasting the meat portion of it and you're putting it back. I know on the boats where you work, when we are processing it, depending if you want to fillet or gill and gutted, um, if they fillet all the meat off and all that stuff is the skeleton and the head, it's almost like hunting. You know, you got all the meat that you could get off of that animal yeah. and let, you know, whether whatever wildlife is going to um, break it down and let nature take its course. As long as we're not like catching and killing for no good reason, yeah. um, there's no problem why you can't. But again, birds will eat it, the vultures, put it back in the water, the crawdads, the crabs, you know, it's, I don't think none of it's going to go to waste as long as you're not just like hacking it up and wasting a lot of the good edible meat on it. Right. Yeah, I agree. I, a lot of times you can just um, put the remains back in the river, or lake, wherever you are, um, you're right back in the water. I would say that if you are going somewhere that's private property, like a private lake, um, or private campground on the river or something, and they have a fillet station available, they might have um, particular places where they want you to put the remains. Oh. Um, and so just be mindful of, you know, signage or posting at whatever water body you go to. But for the most part, it's fine to just put it right back in the water. Okay. Um, speaking of cleaning fish, um, <laughs> any resources on cleaning fish properly would you guys just suggest going to youtube or <laughs> yeah there are your knives and show us topic. aaron and kevin no, i'm just kidding no problem. you don't want me i i cannot <laughs> no i can't fully fish but there are lots of resources out there that will show you and you it's you could probably find almost any fish too um on in those videos so okay yeah. When like Kevin was saying, once you get out there, you, you start making friends and you could probably, you know, if someone's out there willing to help you, they could probably show you. Yeah, uh, YouTube is really good. There's no, the, the easiest way to, to clean a fish is the gill and guts, you know, just take out all the insides and cook it whole if you want to start there before you start filleting it and stuff, you know. Um, I know that there's like scouts and stuff that will go purchase like a whole fish, like a small one from Ralph's or something, and then bring it home and practice on that first, you know? Oh, yeah. So yeah, that's another option is just, that's how they get their merit badge for like cleaning fish if they don't catch them. So you could go get one, you know, something small and then turn on your video. And, and just, again, like I say, rep, everything comes with repetitions. I started filleting fish yeah. when I was about 13, but before they would let me cut somebody's fish, I had to start cutting my little scrub fish out of the bait tank. So it's called a hack <laughs> job and leave like half of the fish uh, on the carcass or something. But, but the guts and gills inside, outside is the best, easiest way to start. Um, and then you could go from filet, but just, you know, sometimes you just got to learn on the job. Yeah. Practice makes perfect. All right. I have read mixed messaging about if I should be bending down, closing the barbs on my hooks. What do you guys think? Is that meaning whether they should make their own barbless hooks? Like so there are places, um, that have regulations in place where the hook has to be barbless. And so, you know, you if you're in that particular area, you can either buy barbless hooks or you can pinch down the barb on your hook. And so I think that is, if you're in that area and you have to have a barbless hook, 
as long as you pinch it down to where like you can't feel any sharpness at all, I think you're fine. I don't quite understand the question, but um, okay. I think it just depends on the regulations for whatever body of water you're at or the location within that larger body of water, you know. The person that asked is chiming in. My hooks all come with barbs and some websites blog say to pinch it down. You only have to do that if you are in a location where barbless hooks are required. Okay. Yeah, that, or or if, um, if I, I kind of mentioned that, I know she was talking about for like safety with the kids, you know, because once oh. you, you know, take a barb in the finger, then it's harder to get out. So if you want to start, you know, um, barbless hooks to fish with just to get nice. yeah. comfortable, you know, to, to um, learn how to handle the hooks before you hook yourself. But like um, Aaron's saying, it's usually, and there's only a couple of species I think up here that you have to worry about using barbless hooks. I think sturgeon and maybe some salmon areas, but yeah, other than that, yeah. it would just be on the website would be if it was for a particular situation, but most primary, most pri primary fishing, you're going to be using your, you want your barb on there for keeping your bait on there and for mm -hmm. keeping the fish. Yeah. Going. Okay. Uh, Kevin, where do you do your kids' fishing clinics? Any in we the Bay Area? Not yet. Right now we're just in Southern California. I'm just a one-man team with some volunteers, but we're looking to, to grow it to see if there's other areas that would like to do something similar um, to what we do. So uh, we do ours down in Southern California every month on the fourth Sunday, except for November and December. Okay. Um, what are the tackle box basics I need to start my family fishing tackle box? Maybe like the top five things I need to purchase for my daughter and I. I know you guys mentioned button reel, reels and beef jerky. <laughs> yeah, I think that we'll just start with where your body of fishing is at. So lake is going to be, I mean, some lake stuff would transfer over to pier because um, you're fishing in shallow water. So, you know, maybe a couple of pinch on sinkers, some sliding sinkers, maybe more than two ounces, you know, size one, two and four hooks. So that's why it's best, again, to recommend individually of what body of water you're going to be fishing in, what tackle. You don't want okay. to use something big, 20 pound test with big hooks if you're fishing in a pond for for trout or something. So again, that's where I would recommend either checking out some YouTube or going into a tackle shop in your area, because there is a lot of stuff that can be misleading. This works for this, this works for that. Primarily though, the tip is if you use smaller setups, you're going to catch more, but they might be smaller fish, but at least you're catching them. Bigger yeah. hooks, bigger fish, you might not catch as many, but when you do catch one, you're going to catch a bigger one. So, you know, something we start with is using smaller hooks to catch smaller fish is a good way to get people started. So if you could okay. you get away with what light gear, um, that's what I recommend. I would try to stay away from lures at the beginning and go with regular bait like night crawlers or anchovies, as opposed to before you start using artificial baits. You'll see a lot of those in the little plastic box. You get those little like grubs and mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing in bobbers. I would just start like a sinker, a weight, I'm sorry, no sinker is a weight, a smaller hook and just regular bait is how I would start. Something that the bait that's going to be good in that particular body of water or fishing. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. Like lures are a little bit, I mean, you can, but I would just start with like getting hooks of various sizes. I would get some bobbers. So that's just like my preference. Split shot barber, bo uh, bobbers, split shots, um, hooks of various sizes. Good. Okay. And Aaron, so, yeah. I think in your Sorry. presentation, go ahead, Kevin. I was just going to say, yeah, that's why it's important to check your body of water because Erin yeah. is a freshwater. So she's really good in that area if that's where you live at. But if you live in the bay and you're going to fish salt water, that might yeah. be a little different just because of the current and the conditions mm -hmm. might not be feasible for that. So just make sure you're, the best thing to do is check your, your area of what type of fishing and then determine to go off of that. But that's about it. Okay. Um, Aaron, I think that during your presentation, you mentioned some species that were good to start with. Can you oh, yeah. say those again? Sure. And so like Kevin was just saying, I, I work in freshwater environments. And so here um, we, and, and across the state, really, like if you're going to fish in like a pond or a lake or something, catfish, um, bluegill, black bass, so largemouth, smallmouth, spotted bass. So black bass and planted trout planted would be trout. The, the species that I would start with. Kevin, what about where you are since you're down south? What would be some good species to start with? Well, we start with is just, uh, we call them the top, Anything? you know, <laughs> in the shallow. Yeah, like we fish and probably we start them at about, um, this again, this is just from the pier just to get started. 
Uh, we only fish in about six to eight feet of water um, just outside the surf. So we catch either perch, mackerel, jack smelt, um, and uh, we, another one we call uh, a bullhead. And that's kind of what we catch in our little area. And those are easy to catch. Again, we just use small hooks. Um, there's also little like sabiki type jigs. They almost mimic plankton. And we'll give them a couple of those and hook them um, and hook in hand. But those are our primary species. Again, they're smaller, but they're it's almost like the equivalent to what you would think about in a lake fishing, you know, the similar kind of tackle um, okay. for just that part of fishing off a of pier, but smaller hooks and catching those jack smelt, mackerel, perch, and, and that sort of stuff. Okay, very good. Um, Aaron, you mentioned there are videos out there for knot tying and casting. Are those mm -hmm. on the CDFW website or did you just mean YouTube? I yeah, think on the Fishing in the City okay. website, yeah. there I are threw a that bunch in the of chat. Things. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I was going through, I think when you go on the website on the right hand side, there's resources or something. Um, I was going through those and there's lots of videos um, for, for those really basic. Um, yeah. Begin, yeah, beginning skills. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay, well, we're at 108. We went a little bit over, but we were getting questions. So I hope nobody minds. But our time together is up. If you didn't get your question answered, which I think I got through all of them, but if you have any more questions, again, you can just email us. Our email address is r3statewideprogram at wildlife.ca.gov. And I'm actually going to be sending a resource email to everyone as soon as we are off this presentation. And it's going to have all the links that Kevin and Aaron mentioned, and then anything extra that we might want to throw in there. I'll throw in the link to the the registration for the fishing in the cities event that's coming up in a couple Saturdays. So um, please also consider joining us for our last R3H3 of 2021. It's going to be on November 12th and we'll look at wild foods and the holidays, a look at using fish game and forged item for holiday meals and more. Uh, registration is up for that right now as well. And it'll also be on our social media pages in the coming weeks. So give us a like or a follow so you can stay up to date on all of our events. Again, this session was recorded. It'll be available on the R3 page in the coming days. A huge thank you to Aaron and Kevin and all of you, our huddlers, for taking the steps to educate yourself on becoming the best anglers you can be. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you both presenters for being here. Hey, have a happy Halloween this weekend, guys. Thank Thanks you for, for having me. Yeah, this is cool. All right, see you soon. <laughs>